The word of life that God has permitted for us today comes from Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. I will now read. Please follow along with your eyes. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. This is the word of God. Amen. So today, based on Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, I want to share with you uh, this uh, message entitled, Calendar of the Wilderness Journey. We're in the fourth week now. So I want to welcome all of you to Evergreen Church, and uh, I pray that your week has been fruitful and victorious, and I pray that God will be with you starting from tomorrow as you go back out into the world. May he lead and guide you so that we could live a triumphant life in Christ. Amen? All right, so we're studying about the calendar, which might be a strange thing for some of us at church. But the calendar is a very important thing because it dictates our life. It dictates how we spend our days and our time. And so the calendar is very important and we need to understand about God's calendar that is given in the Bible. So we've been studying about the day, the week, the month. Today we're going to be studying about the years and seasons. So if, when we confess that Jesus is our Lord, what we are saying is that he is master and ruler over every aspect of our life. Okay? That includes everything, including our time. Okay? Because God gave us everything, right? He gave us our, our bodies, our souls, our life, you know, our family, everything that we own, our church, you know, our talents, our knowledge, everything is from God. And when he gave us all those things, he, he didn't say, I want it all back. What he said was, this is all for your use, but I want the first fruits, the tithe for me. So for example, if you earn $10, just give me one. Even though all ten of that is mine, I just want one-tenth of that. And that includes our time. So God has given us seven days a week, right? But he says, you could use the six days for your own work, for your own pleasure, but one day out of the week is mine. That's why we call it the Lord's Day, right? Just give me one day. That's all he's asking. He gave us all the time, right? This time that we have is from him. It's not ours. But he just said, give me one day, right? And that's the Lord's day. That's today. If you give me one day, and if you turn your feet from doing your own thing and doing your own pleasures, but if you come into God's house and worship him on this day, then he will bless every other day in your life. That's God's promise to us, right? It's not a bad deal. It's a very good deal. But human beings are so stubborn and selfish that they don't even want to give that up, right? Even that one day, okay? So by giving him this day, what we're we're doing is what we're hoping to become in sync with God. We want our time to be in sync with God so that we could walk with him step by step, right? That's why we're learning about the calendar. So today we're talking about the year. One year, we're in the year 2019, right? There's 365 days in a year. What controls the year? It's the sun, right? One year is the time it takes for the earth to revolve around the sun. So the sun is here, the earth goes around it, right? So you start here when you 
go around and come back to the same spot, that's one year. That takes one year. Okay? So the sun dictates the year. In Hebrew, the word for year is shana, which comes from the root word, which means to change. Okay? The Hebrew word for year is shana, and the root word literally means to change. So scholars think, they're guessing that they call, use this word for year because when you look at the year, the seasons change, right? You go from winter, spring, summer, fall. So you see the changes throughout the year, right? So they think that they name the year with this word, change. And now we're talking about year and also seasons, right? We have four seasons in a year, right? Spring, summer, fall, and winter. And what makes these seasons change? It's the, the relationship of the sun and the earth, right? If we're just slightly closer to the sun, the sun is so hot that if we're a little bit closer to the sun, it becomes summer. If we're a little bit farther away from the sun, it becomes winter. That's how hot it is. That's how powerful it is. So... What makes the seasons change is that the earth is tilted, right? If this is straight, the earth is tilted like this, 23 degrees or something like that, right? So because, let's say, this is the equator, so if, and if the sun is over here, if you're living in the northern hemisphere, like us, we're in North America, if you're li living up here, now it's summer because you're tilting towards the sun. If you're down here, it's winter because you're farther away from the sun. And if you turn the other way, it's the opposite, right? That's what gives us the seasons. Just that slight tilt makes these changes in seasons. Okay? So the seasons are a reflection of the distance, the relationship between the sun and the earth. Now, last week we learned that you know, in the Bible, the Hebrew calendar, which is used in the Bible, is a lunar calendar, right? So it's based on the moon. One month is the length of the cycle of the moon, right? The problem with this is this. After 12 months, one month is like 29 to 30 days in the lunar calendar. After 12 months you're about 11 days off with the sun, okay? So you're 11 days off. After two years, you're 22 days off. After three years, you're 33 days off. So that means after three years, what happens? Let's say it's supposed to be spring, but it's still cold. Spring is a month away. You can't farm yet. See, back then, they were all farmers, right? So they depend on the calendar to tell them when spring's going to come so they could get the field ready to sow the seeds, right? Well, it's springtime, but it's still too cold. So what do they have to do? In order to adjust that, they had to add one month every three years or so, okay? So in the Hebrew calendar, the last month was called Adar. That's like our December. That's the last month of the year. That's the 12th month. But every three years, if the seasons are off with the lunar calendar, what do they do? They add one month, and they call it a second Adar, Adar number two. They add 30 more days to it to adjust the calendar so that it would fit the seasons. Because in the Hebrew calendar started in spring. For us now, we start in winter, right? January is winter. But the Hebrew calendar starts in springtime. Because back then, it was an agricultural farming society, right? So they had to fit everything according to the farming, you know, their livelihood is farming. So the year starts at springtime. So when the first month comes, farmers get ready. They need to go out and plant seeds, right? But if it's too cold, 
then they would have to add one more month, wait another month for the next year to begin. That's how they adjusted the lunar and the solar, the moon and the sun. Okay? So, for example, June 21st, which was a couple days ago, you know what day that was? What was June 21st? I'm sorry? It wasn't my birthday. June 21st was what's called summer solstice. What is summer solstice? That's the longest day of the year. That's where, when the sun is up the longest and the night is shortest. I don't know the exact time, but I, I heard it's like almost 18 hours long, the day was. Or I don't know if that's right or not. But anyway, summer solstice is the longest day of the year, and it's the beginning of summer. Okay? So you have, we have these four important points in the year where the seasons change. The first one is called spring equinox. That's the beginning of spring, usually March 20th to 23rd, somewhere around there. Why is this day important? That's the day, spring equinox. See, equal means equal, right? That means the length of the day and the length of the night are equal. Exactly 12 hours long. Okay? And then summer solstice comes in June, where the day is the longest. And then from this day, the day gets a little bit shorter, 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 until we come to autumnal equinox in the fall where the days are equal again, 12 hours day, 12 hours night. And then it gets shorter still, and then we get to winter solstice. Where, so this is in September, and then in December, about 21st or somewhere around there, it comes winter solstice where the day is the shortest and the night is the longest. Right? So the ancient peoples, like, observed the suns, and this is what they figured out. So why am I telling you this? Why do we need to know this? Because the feasts in the Bible are related to some of these things. So for example, Passover, which we've been talking about for a little bit, right? When the Exodus took place, that was the first Passover, the date of Passover is... The first full moon after spring equinox. That's how you figure out the date of Passover. First full moon after spring equinox. So you see what God is doing here? Spring equinox is determined by the sun. Full moon is obviously determined by the moon, right? So the... the, Feasts in the Bible have to take into account both the sun and the moon. You have to adjust these two things and put them in sync in order to figure out these dates. And for Christians now, Easter is related with Passover, right? Because what happened? In the Old Testament, Passover was when the 10th plague took place. God sent the angel of death and killed the firstborn of every household that did not have the blood of the lamb on their doorpost and lintel, right? And after that, the Israelites were able to come out, exodus from Egypt. But in the New Testament, what happened on Passover day? The true Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, died on the cross on Passover day. And his blood is what saves us from sin and death, right? It happened on that same day. And then three days later, right, he died on Friday, Passover day, and on Sunday he resurrected, right? That's Easter. So Passover and Easter are closely related, right? So for Christians, how do we figure out when Easter is? It's just like the Jewish Passover. Easter is the first Sunday, first Sunday after the first full moon after spring equinox. You just add one more thing, right? 
Passover is the first full moon after spring equinox, and Easter is the first Sunday that comes after the first full moon after spring equinox. So you see, God wants us to take into account both the sun and the moon. These two have to be in sync. They have to be adjusted to be in sync with each other. So what is this teaching us? As I said, the word for year in Hebrew means to change, right? This shows us how human beings are changing. We're always changing. We're never constant, right? Sinful human beings are always changing. Our minds change every day, even twice a day, three times a day, five times a day. We're just changing, right? But God is never changing, right? God is unchanging. So through this calendar, through the year and the seasons and the lunar calendar, he wants all of these things to be adjusted to fit each other. So through that, he's trying to teach us that we need to adjust our lives to fit with the rhythms of God, to fit with God's time. We need to adjust ourselves to be in sync with the unchanging God. So let's all turn to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8 says this. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Amen. See? Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Right? He's unchanging. We're the ones that are changing. So through our life of faith and through the biblical calendars and through the feasts, especially like Passover, Easter, right? Through these feasts, by learning how God wants the moon and the sun to be in sync, he wants us to adjust our lives to fit with God. So coming to church on Sundays, this is a time of adjusting our lives to God. For six days, we've been drifting away. We may have been. We could have been. But on Sunday, we come into God's house and get in sync with God, right? And then for feasts like Easter or Christmas or Feast of Pentecost, we have various feasts during the year, right? Those things help us to also adjust ourselves to God's time. It is because God is unchanging that his covenant remains with us. And that's why we're still alive. Because he made a promise that he will save us. That he will get, make us heirs of the kingdom of God, right? That promise was made a very long time ago, right? To Abraham, thousands of years ago. But God's still keeping that promise. If he were changing his mind like us, we would all be dead by now. Right? That's what Malachi chapter 3 verse 6 says. Malachi chapter 3 verses 6 and 7 says this. He says, God says, I am unchanging. That's why you're still alive. That's why you have not been consumed. Right? And then he goes on to say, return to me, then I will accept you. Right? If God were fickle like we were, we would all be dead in our sins by now. But because he's unchanging, he's still keeping the promise that he made to Abraham and to Isaac and Jacob, even until today. So through these feasts and through the calendar of the Bible, this is the lesson that I would like for us to just take away with, to go, get away, go away with uh, through these teachings, okay? And that is this. We need to... Figure out what is eternal, what is unchanging, what is steadfast, what is constant. And we need to tie ourselves. We need to tether ourselves and we need to hold on to those things. Because if you're holding on to temporal things, things that will eventually disappear or be destroyed, then we're going to fall away when those things are destroyed too, right? So we need to hold on to what is eternal. The things in the world are not eternal. They're temporary. 
history changes so much, right? Until the Middle Ages, people thought that the sun revolved around the earth. That was the truth. And, but truth changes. But there is something that does not change forever. And that is the word of God. That's what the Bible says, right? Please turn with me to Matthew chapter 24, verses 34 and 35. Matthew chapter 24, verse 35, verse 35. Matthew 24, 35 says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Amen? See, God's word is unchanging. So even if you look at the history of redemption from Old Testament times to New Testament times until today, God built certain things up at certain times, but God also destroyed certain things. For example, in the wilderness, what did God give them? He gave them the tabernacle, right, and sacrifices. So he said, during the wilderness days, you're going to worship me in the tabernacle. Okay? So they did that. And then after a while, when Solomon became king, God told Solomon to build a, an actual temple that doesn't move, permanent. So they built the temple of God. Solomon built a temple. And so for hundreds of years, they thought this was it. This was the unmovable house of God, right? But then all of a sudden, the Babylonians came and destroyed the temple. That was like a big shock to the Israelites. This was what they depended on. This is God's house. God lives here, they thought. But the Babylonians, these Gentiles came and destroyed it, burned it down. Now there are prisoners in Babylon, and they're thinking, what's going on? Did we believe in the wrong God? Is God dead? Why is this happening? And this was something that people like Ezra and Nehemiah really struggled with, right? But afterwards, in hindsight, we could realize what God was doing. God was building certain things up at certain times because that's where the people were. That's what they needed to have in order to come and meet with God and to believe in God. But after its purpose is fulfilled, God would destroy it so that these people would move on to the next level and learn deeper things. So after Solomon's temple was destroyed, what did they realize? They realized that they still had the Bible with them. Even in Babylon, they had the word of God with them. And this was what's truly important for God. He wanted them to realize that. That's why he sent them into captivity into Babylon. This you can't take away. I could take this wherever I go. You don't need the temple anymore. God's word is with me. So this is what we need to understand. There are many things in the world. A lot of people have different viewpoints and perspectives. Their priorities are different. Some people really depend on money. Some people depend on other people. Some people depend on whatever, their jobs, or what have you. But ultimately, all those things will disappear. Then what are you going to depend on? What God is trying to teach us is, don't depend on any of those things. Depend only on God and his word. That's it. Nothing else and no one else. That's the lesson that he's trying to teach us. So let's look up a few verses before we end. First, let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18 says this. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Amen, right? You see what God is saying here? The things that you could see, visible things like this, they will eventually disappear. Things break down, right? 
Machines get broken and they just disappear. But the invisible things, that's what's eternal. God and his word, our spirit, the invisible things are what's important. And we need to hold on to those things. And let's also look at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 26 through 28. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 26 through 28. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 26 to 28 says, And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an, accept, an acceptable service with reverence and awe. Amen, right? See what God is saying here? In the Old Testament times, he shook the earth and destroyed some things, like he destroyed Egypt, brought the Israelites out of Egypt. He gave them the tabernacle, but then destroyed it. He gave them the temple, but then destroyed it again. So why does he keep doing that? So that only what's eternal may remain. He's trying to show us by shaking things up and showing us what's crumbling away. He wants us to realize, oh, we can't trust on, uh, and depend on those things. We have to trust only in the one and only God and the word of God that he has given to us. That's the lessons that, that we need to get take away from here. And when we trust in those things, the unshakable things, the eternal things, then we will be unshakable. Then we will be unmoved by anything. And we won't be shaken up by anything that happens in the world because we have the unmovable word of God in us, right? That's the true strength that we need to overcome this world. If you're depending on money, money will come and go. It's eventually just going to shake you up. And you're going to fall away with the money. If you're depending on the powers of this world, people come to power, people fall away from power. Can't depend on that. Only the word of God remains forever. So I pray that all of us here will learn to disregard all those things. And when I say disregard, I'm not saying we, can't, we don't need those things. As we're living here on earth, we need those things but don't trust in them. Don't depend on them. Don't make them your foundation. Only the word of God can be our foundation. And that's the true people of God. That's how they are. So in the Bible, Mount Zion is the symbol of this steadfastness. Right? Let's end by reading Psalm 125, verse 1. Psalm 125, verse 1. Can we all read this together? Some of us may have different versions, but that's okay. Let's all read it together in one voice. Psalm 125, verse 1. Ready? Begin. Those who trust in the Lord are as Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. Amen. I pray that all of us will trust only in God and in his word so that we may be like Mount Zion, unmovable, and that we may all dwell forever, and receive eternal life with our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this holy day, the Lord's Day, which you have given to us. You have given us all the time that we are able to live with, but you have asked us to give back to you just one day out of the week. Father God, help us to take that word to heart and be diligent in observing your Lord's Day. May we turn away from doing our own pleasures on this day, but may we come into your house and worship you in spirit and in truth so that every other day may be blessed by you, Lord. We thank you so much for giving us your word 
and we thank you so much for giving us the grace to be able to hear and understand and believe in this word. As we have learned today, help us to not trust in the things of the world, the things that are seen, but help us to only depend on you, Lord, and your word. May we hold on only to your word so that even though the heavens and the earth may be shaken, that we may be unmovable and steadfast in believing in you and trusting in you, Lord. God, we thank you so much for all the blessings that you have given to us in our lives. It is now time to give our offering to you. Whatever the amount may be, we give with all of our heart, and I pray that you will accept this offering and take delight in this offering and bless the hands that are giving so that they may, be, they may receive the blessing of prosperity and abundance and health in all of their lives. We thank you so much, and we give you all the glory, and we pray all of these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ with thanksgiving. Amen. Let's give glory to God with our applause.